has turned your white clouds to your dark gray And you taste the tears and the rain And I know you have all the strength to find your way As you teach the world to be brave in 1996, before 14-year-old Ricky Ann Blake was brutally murdered, she was getting prank calls from a man who called himself George. He would be quite graphic and obscene on the calls. After she was murdered, her parents continued to be tortured by the killer calling them to discuss the gory details of her death. After he was caught in 2003 through DNA, his history would come to light. This man should have never been out of prison due to his brutal offenses to children in the past. Come join me in the murder she shed, the place we honor the dead, right from my little she shed. And my name is Holly. Hit that subscribe for more rarely told true crime, right from my she shed. And you get to hear this southern girl all the time tell you true crime. Never mind. That sucked. Since this case does involve children, I must give a warning. Viewer discretion is advised. In 1986, Ricky Ann Blake was in ninth grade. Ricky lived with her parents and older sister nicknamed Bootsy in Chula Vista, California. Ricky had a boyfriend named Henry who went to school with her, but Ricky was still completely innocent and never had even kissed her boyfriend. Ricky was shy and enjoyed playing with her Cabbage Patch dolls. She dressed them in pajamas every night before she fell asleep. Her best friend's name was Kristen. On April 10, 1996, her father picked her up from school and took her to the dentist. When they returned home that evening, Ricky complained that her teeth were actually hurting. She had soup and ice cream before dinner and took some aspirin to relieve her tooth pain. When her parents went to bed at around 9 or 9.30 p.m. that night, Ricky was watching a San Diego Padres baseball game on television. She loved to watch them. Her parents' bedroom door was closed. Bootsy and her two girlfriends returned home about 10.30 p.m. and went outside with Ricky to talk. The girlfriends left, and then Ricky and Bootsy went inside again. Ricky was talking on the phone to her boyfriend Henry and friend Kristen on a three-way call. In the 80s, you know, it was a big deal to be able to put people on three-way and speak to more, you know, multiple people. This was a big deal. This before cell phones, and when we just had started having cordless, I mean, we were so cool back in those days, right, with those phones? Well, she decided she was going to talk to her boyfriend and her girlfriend that would be so cool at the same time. Bootsy, while she was doing that, went and locked the front and back door and asked Ricky to get off the phone. Ricky hung up the phone and brought it to Bootsy in her bedroom. Around 11 or 11.30 p.m., the phone rang. Bootsy answered and a man named George asked for Ricky. Bootsy didn't recognize who he was and the only George she knew was a neighbor named George, but knew it was not his voice. Ricky retrieved the phone to take the call and returned to her bedroom with the phone. Bootsy just fell asleep. But the next morning, Miss Blake woke up around 5 a.m. and found the front door open. The lights and the television were on. Ricky's shoes were near the front door and she had not slept in her bedroom. She knew that Ricky would not have left without her shoes. Even if she was to go run away, she's gonna need her shoes. It's just odd that her shoes were still there. Even something on her was that her cabbage patch dolls that she always put in their pajamas at night had never been changed that night. The Blakes called neighbors and friends and then the police. Mr. Blake drove around looking for Ricky. After 10 p.m. that night, a motorist found Ricky's body on the main street off-ramp of Interstate 15 on San Diego County. Ricky was laying on her back. Her face had been beaten. She had bruising around her left eye and cheek and slight bruising on her chin and lip. She was wearing a pink sweatshirt, black pants, and dirty socks. She was not wearing shoes. There were bloodstains on Ricky's sweatshirt collar, on the white tank top she wore underneath in the sweatshirt, and on her bra straps. Her black pants and underpants had the odor of urine. It appeared that Ricky had not been killed where her body was found. Her cause of death was noted as asphyxia caused by strangulation. It is believed her head had been slammed against a hard, flat surface before her death. Her head had either been hit forcefully against something or a board was hit into her head. Either way, it caused her horrific head damage. Her front teeth had been chipped due to a bottle hitting her in the mouth. 
the injuries to her mouth, fluid he found in her lungs, and the 0.04 blood alcohol level during toxicology testing were consistent with her being force-fed alcohol that went into her lungs. Ricky had been SI'd. Ricky's funeral was packed with hundreds of mourners, and the bereaved family played Ricky's favorite song, With You All The Way, by New Edition. Somewhere in the crowd, it's believed that the killer lurked. This killer would soon begin to torment the Blake family with phone calls. He would use Ricky's favorite song as a tool to torment Ricky's mom, Alicia. When the man called, he would often play Ricky's favorite song into the phone. His caller usually phoned between 3 and 4 a.m., but whenever Mr. Bill Blake answered, the man would simply hang up. In the months following the murder, several of Ricky's classmates would also complain of getting these disturbing calls from a man who identified as George, and he was obscene with them too. The Blake's family home was broken into at one point, and boxes of Ricky's things were stolen. These items would be left on Ricky's grave or at the family's home for her mother to find. The most creepy to be found was strips of a man's shirt stuffed into a vase and placed upon the girl's grave. Often he would call to recount exactly what Alicia had done that day. If she had gone to her daughter's grave, the man always knew. He would tell the grieving mother that he had been there the entire time watching in the shadows. Alicia was worried for her surviving daughter, Bootsy, so she actually sent her out of town to live with relatives. But the brave mother refused to move away from her home or even change her phone number. She believed that eventually, this psychopath would slip up and he'd give away to his identity. When asked if she was worried for her own safety, Alicia stated, I used to be scared, but I'm not scared anymore. There's nothing you could do to hurt me anymore. You've killed me inside. You can't kill me anymore. The caller tormented the family for 10 years. 10 years, guys. For 10 years, they were tormented, mostly around her birthday and around her death date. He tormented the family. Horrible. In 2003, DNA technology was able to find Ricky's killer, though. The culprit was a 47-year-old construction worker named George Williams Jr. from Gary, Indiana. William's mother was physically abusive and his father was an alcoholic that left the family when Williams was small. He moved in with his uncle when he was about 12 and was given daily beatings. Between the ages of 10 and 13, he was molested by an older male when at a boys club. In 1978, he joined the Navy and developed an alcohol problem. When William's daughter was six years old, he gave her alcohol and attempted to molest his own daughter. Yes. This only gets worse from here. This guy is a creepo. Creepy. Why he was out, I don't know. In 1981, he essayed a 15-year-old girl after taking her on a drive to what was supposed to have been the store. But instead, he took her to a deserted, dark area, forced her into the back of his van, ripped off her clothes, and RAP'd her. He then RAP'd another woman in 1985. He drove the woman to a freeway overpass and told her that he wanted to have SEX with her. When she refused, he tied her up with his belt and some shoelaces and R.A.P.'d her. In 1996, just one week after Ricky's murder and after getting a divorce from his wife, who he still visited two or three times weekly, this is when he decided to follow his ex-wife's neighbor, Velma, into her apartment across the hallway from his ex-wife's apartment. He followed Velma into her apartment, threatened her with a knife and bound her wrist with a curling iron cord and her ankles with the phone cord. He poured baby oil on her private area and S ate her. He then used a knife to cut off some of her pubic hair. After it was finished, he tied her back up and asked her who else was in the apartment. She told them her girls were asleep in the room, but she begged him not to bother her girls. Please do whatever you want to to me, but don't bother my girls. But he got up, he left the room, and in a few minutes, she heard one of her little girls screaming. Here she is tied up. She couldn't do nothing for her little girls. Can you imagine how horrible that would feel as a mother? I can't even imagine. He had went into the, her little girl's room and essayed her six-year-old little daughter. Then came back in the room with Velma and assaulted her again before falling asleep. No conscious. After he fell asleep, Velma was actually able to untie herself 
And she went and grabbed her girls and left. He then spent 10 years in prison for this assault. Just 10 years. Just disturbing. He shouldn't have been out. He shouldn't have been out to even have done that. And, and he wouldn't end up murdering Ricky. He should have been in prison from the other things that he had done in the past. But he was not. Then in 1998, he molested his 14-year-old male cousin. After it was learned that Williams was Ricky's killer, there was an odd mystery left in the air. The man that had called the family for 10 years to torture them about Ricky's death could not have been Williams since he had been put in prison immediately after Ricky was murdered. So who was this man who'd stalked the family, broke into their home, left things on Ricky's grave? Could Williams have an accomplice? This man seemed to know certain details that only the killer could have known. George William was sentenced to death for the kidnapping, R.I.P.E., and murder of Ricky in 2005. But who the mystery caller was, we will never know. After he was caught in 2003, oh good God. Hit the subscribe for more the rarely heard to told, yeah, told to, to, true crap. Never mind. That was all a rhyme, and it all sucked. Apparently, no one should pay me a dime. In 1986, Ricky and Blank was in ninth grade. Licky, Licky. God, Licky. Ooh. Family played Ricky's favorite song. Look, it's gonna hear on my mouth. And there's a freaking huge spider. Holy cow. When did they get my murder she shed? I'm gonna murder that spider right now. It's really officially gonna be a murder she shit. Anyway, when I was a child, I had a horse named Bub. And I had to water him. And I went outside to water him. I was a teenager and I had braces on at the time. So I had the water hose in my hand and I go to bend over to, I don't remember. Seems like I had a watermelon, too, I was going to give him. He liked to eat watermelons. He always get this red nose when he eat watermelons. But I've been over to give him this and had the water hose in my hand. When I did, I touched my braces to that electric fence we had. You want to talk about a son of a gun? Yeah, pain, that. It, okay, it, my mouth was, it just hit right here. My mouth was closed pretty much. And I had go to school with a line, electric wire line across my mouth right here. About embarrassing, how do you explain that one? <laughs> oh, I got electrocuted with my braces. <laughs> yeah, that hurt like a son of a gun, I'm gonna tell you. I don't, I don't ever advise getting shocked. You yeah, have braces on, cause quite painful actually, quite painful. I don't know where that story came from. I don't know where a lot of my stories come from, but oh, just farm girl stories. <laughs> Life of a farm girl. This baby's been good to die. He's been a good boy. He's been a real good boy to die. Say so we love y'all. We hope to see y'all soon. We hope to see y'all soon. Get your little snotty nose off of me. He's a good boy. He's a good boy. He's a good boy. He's a good boy. And I know. I don't want to get you too wound up. Follow the light. It speaks to you.